Welcome to our panel on, you see it, campaigning for a green society. And before we've met, we actually met online, like a speed dating online, um, probably all of us here um, up on the panel had a different idea on what we're going to talk. And um, as I was asked by my cast colleagues to moderate the panel, I wasn't, um, well, of course, um, my dear fellow panelists, um, I looked you up on the internet, but before I did that, um, I actually strolled through the internet all over and thinking, well, environmental campaigns, let's look up the list of the 10 most impact environmental campaigns, or maybe the 20 or 30. Because before I was doing that, I was thinking, is there actually an environmental campaign that I can recall or that kind of impacted me or changed my behavior, behavior as it would have been happening with a political campaign? Or is there actually anything I know? Do I know how NGOs or governments or um, international institutions, organizations actually get to the people into their mindsets? Um, do I know anything about it? And then I looked up the list with the campaigns and they were great, but I had no idea that they actually existed. And I um, took a step forward and was looking uh, for projects first in, in Uruguay, um, Latin America, where, where there's a lot of wind and sun, as in many other regions of the world where um, renewable energies don't play such a big role as in countries like my home country, Germany, where we don't have so much wind, and, well, wind we do, but not so much sun, but still we try to get everything out of it. Um, and so I came, I found uh, little campaigns and I was thinking, well, are they actually intertwined? Are they actually, um, do they know of each other? Do they uh, know what their counterparts um, in Asia are doing or in Africa? What kind of initiatives are there? And do actually international institutions, NGOs who work uh, all over the world, do they actually have a clue of what's going on in other regions and um, who's actually in that? So it was kind of a little uh, journey for me. And then um, I looked you up and Vladimir, you're an artist, you're born in Serbia and I um, promise you I won't talk too much about their biographies because they make part of what uh, we're gonna be presented and what makes the, word, uh, the work of uh, the three panelists. And then Laura, you, well, you now are a um, Singapore-based artist and teacher here. Um, Vladimir, and Laura as well, she's from Australia, also Singapore-based, so that makes two expats here, trying to get ideas onto uh, Singaporean heads and, and the international community as well. You told me that you um, learned it the hard way in the corporate world, and um, that's why you actually got back to your roots. Um, you grew up on a farm in rural Australia, and it, was always, it has always been important to you to kind of find a sustainable way of life, not only for yourself, but also for your surroundings and give something to, to the world in that fact. So i um, very keen to see what you've been done um, in, in getting out of the corporate world and still remain in that and try to connect the two sides. And then Ravi, Ravi Agarwal, he is a engineer, a civil engineer, well, you're educated as an engineer, and um, that's always a good thing when you enter in politics or you work um, for, for, for the common good, because, well, as we see, it, for example, with our Chancellor Merkel, she's a physicist, and um, she's famous for never ever losing the side, um, the end, what's the goal, and how do we have to achieve it, and w what frame do we need for that. Um, and you also are an artist. And there's um, the point when, when I actually, when I, I read your biographies and, and read what you told the, the organizers of the conference, what, what you're doing, that's when I'm thinking, okay, 
what 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 art initiatives, what movies have I seen that actually impacted me? What spots and and how do we actually get that through the audience and through normal people? And um, who's been to the other um, room um, to the session on social media and how do we use that to get into people's minds? That was quite interesting because that's something sometimes isolated, it happens, and we talked about that yesterday, when you see a nice initiative of a 16-year-old boy in Australia trying to clean the oceans, or a school project, and that goes viral um, on the internet, on social media. Um, but still, and that's something we named of, and that will be in this room as well. Ravi, you named it yesterday, that the elephant in the room isn't being tackled. Um, so we all knew, know that climate change, environmental topics are the actual topic, the actual thing that will concern us throughout the next decades and probably um, define how mankind uh, will live and if it will live. So um, what do we do? Where do we get? How do we actually raise problem awareness, how do we do that by art? Um, when I talk to my children and they are in whatever kind of museum and talk about art and they yell about something that they don't like, I, s I would always tell them, well, you see that raises your emotions, that's why um, it works as art. So give us a hindsight, um, tell us um, where we can go forward and how we could um, move on the elephant and eat it bit by bit, something I've learned here as well. Wonderful, thank you very much. So, um, I'm just gonna stand up here for a little bit of energy. Um, I'm also gonna raise the other elephant in the room, which is I think as a group of people, we're gonna have to work hard to campaign because there's so few of us. Um, if anyone wants to come closer, I mean, we can have this as a very intimate session and, and be able to ask questions and so on. Um, so, there we go. I have to be told where I need to click this. There we go. <laughs> so, um, so before I jump into things, uh, okay. Um, so I work for Gone Adventuring. Uh, we're a social business based out of Singapore. Uh, we co-founded this about six years ago. Um, with the belief that we needed to take business leaders out of the office to really understand environmental and social issues firsthand. I mean, seriously, how can you create a sustainability plan from the boardroom? It's like, <laughs> it's impossible. Um, and also, how do, you, how do you really get that drive and the commitment within businesses to fulfill those plans if there's not a sense of empathy, um, if there's no real engagement behind it? So we started by taking business leaders from banks, from FMCG companies to go and experience social and environmental issues firsthand. And we cr would create videos, photo stories to be able to communicate that internally in the organization and externally. Um, and it was great but we were realizing that we were kind of using marketing money of businesses. And as soon as you're using marketing money of businesses, you're at the tail end of where things really happen. You're not driving the strategy of businesses. And we realized we needed to become technical experts. We couldn't be generalists in water, sustainable sourcing, and all of these different topics. Uh, and as we were starting to decide what would be that topic that we would champion in Asia and stand for for the next decades, uh, we were looking at the rise of the waste issue around the world, FMCG companies were starting to come to us and say, you know, what do we do about plastics? Can you do some research and strategy on this? At the same time, Ellen MacArthur Foundation in uh, the UK had started to raise this idea of a circular economy as the solution for a lot of our environmental challenges and a really systemic and different way of, of looking at things. Um, and we also we're always faced with this issue of waste everywhere we went. You think about the issue of water and water st scarcity, it's connected so closely with waste. Uh, again, uh, incomes of people is connected to materials that they're then selling and, and uh, being able to make incomes from. So we saw that it was really connected in every part of our work. Uh, 
What we do here in Singapore in the region is we do research and strategy. Uh, we implement projects with companies and with governments to be able to create a success model where th there is actually a success of circularity for materials like plastics or metals. And then we create stories about it. At the same time, here in Singapore, we're sort of campaigning. We're creating events and a community that is interested in this idea of uh, circularity. Uh, just, can I get a show of hands? Does anyone know what circular economy means? Have you heard of it before? Okay, super quickly, it's this idea that instead of something that's linear, where we take all of these resources out of the ground, we make things and then we dispose of them, it's something where it's, it's circular. Everything stays in a cycle. Um, so that's at a very, very basic level. So this is our daily reality that frustrates us annoys us um, and drives us to, to do what we do. So this entire region of Asia is in a waste crisis. Um, you just look at these, these headlines and you see, you know, Indonesia has got landfills that are overflowing. There's garbage dumps in, for example, in Mumbai in India that have uh, got so much methane in them that they exploded and huge fires. Um, and this is only gonna get worse. So this is a, a landfill in uh, Mumbai. I'm on a different set of slides, so bear with me as I <laughs> go to an uh, earlier edition. Um, so we're actually just at the tip of the iceberg. Uh, waste is projected to grow three to five times in Asia by 2025. Um, so if you think about the fact that um, cities like Jakarta, Mumbai, they're already struggling, it really is just the start of things because of the amount of rising populations and consumption. Um, we are literally looking at a waste tsunami. And as we, our team has worked more and more on this issue, I have to say that I've kind of gotten quite, in a way, angry, frustrated, and sometimes a, a little bit depressed. And I'll tell you a little bit of some of the stories as to why that is. But I first want to share something that I realized recently, and it comes a little bit towards the, the idea of campaigning and thinking about how to do things in a smart way to really get a, an impact. So my team is fortunate to be the uh, Asia partner for National Geographic. We bring a set of explorers here every year. And just a few weeks ago, I had a name, a guy called Tristram Stewart, who's a uh, food waste campaigner from the UK. In his teens, he was jumping in the back of dumpsters in supermarkets in the UK, and then taking reporters and showing them about it, and then creating events. Um, and he's literally created the food waste movement around the world. And what he said is, being right is not enough. You have to convince the decision makers to believe you and act. You have to create a situation where decision makers can't say no. Otherwise, they just ignore you. And this is what my team and I experience as a social business day in, day out, where we're proactively trying to work with businesses and governments and, and create solutions, but there's really not enough pressure for all of these companies to actually act. So I feel like as, as every month goes by, I'm leaning more and more away from sort of this middle stream and starting to feel a little bit more activist-y um, so that we can get attention and that we can actually get results. And a little bit of, of why that is. If, um, I'm sure many of you have seen all of the articles around the world about ocean plastics. Um, Eight million tons every single year, 80% comes from Asia. Most of us would think, this is really only something that's, that's come to light in the last couple of years. But you dig a little bit deeper, and this has been spoken about since the 1990s. We're 25 years later, and we're really still only talking about it and not acting. Um, so this is the guy who found the first gyre and then wrote a book about it. Um, just quickly, this is a picture you've probably very often seen about how much plastics is here in Asia. Uh, Okay, so what we're seeing nowadays is a lot more articles about this plastics issue in the region. Um, plastic coming into our seafood, plastic coming into our plates. Uh, so there's a lot more media attention on the issue, but a lot of it is not digging any further beyond sort of a, a surface level. And I'd particularly say that from a corporate perspective. So somehow as a public and as journalists, we sort of allow companies to make these bold statements to say we're making all of our items recyclable, yet 
we don't really consider, okay, what's actually behind this or question. Um, so we take the example on the left, is actually a great piece of investigative journalism about Coke. So before I explain, a little bit of background. Around the world, we only recycle 14% of all plastics. And we've had recycling labels since the 60s. Like, how can we be doing so badly at this? Um, so of all plastic bottles that are created, if you put 100 of these out there, maybe only 14 of them will become a plastic bottle again. Actually, 70% of these will end up in the oceans or in landfills. Like, isn't that ludicrous that we recycle like <laughs> one seventh, one sixth that of what actually ends up in the environment? Um, and a lot of companies have kind of shied away from really talking about this and it hasn't actually got that much attention from the media or pressure. Uh, and only recently have businesses starting to say, well, we're gonna make all of our packaging recyclable. But so what? So what if this is actually recyclable? Unless you buy it back, you're not gonna close the loop and, and make that circular. Um, and that's what some good journalists have started doing, out of, especially out of the UK. I have a lot of respect for the work that Guardian Sustainable Business does, where they actually started questioning Coca-Cola, saying, well, you can't claim recyclability if only 7%, like literally only 7% of their content is recycled content. And then you take this example of Unilever says, we're gonna get to 100% recyclable plastic packaging by 2025, but does anyone question how much recycled content they're actually using? So I was doing a, a bit of a scan through headlines and literally what you see is Unilever puts out a press release to say, you know, we're committing to 100% recyclable packaging and every single news uh, media publishes that exact same headline. Nobody questions and says, well, you're actually only using 10% of your content as recycled content. It really concerns me that as a public and as, as media, we've essentially become the mouthpiece of companies and the PR sort of arm of companies and almost nobody questioning the facts. And, and I get why. Every, uh, everyday person has not enough time to actually think about this and to question it. And to be a, you know, to really write well on this as a journalist, you would need to become an expert on waste management and circular economy. And how many journalists do we actually have as an expert on, on that? I certainly don't have the answer, but it's a serious issue that, that I see um, in this region today. Uh, just quickly in terms of uh, actually getting results on this. So um, I was very inspired uh, over the last weeks through um, this National Geographic Explorer, Tristram Stewart, coming, coming to Singapore uh, and what he was sharing in terms of actually getting results, getting people to pay attention. So he wrote this incredibly data-heavy book um, about 10 years ago called Uncovering the Global Food Waste Scandal and realized very quickly, no one was really going to read that. Only the nerds like me would actually uh, read this book. And he was working out, well, how do I bring this to the masses? And what he created was this beautiful public event engaging 5,000 people every time to raise awareness about the food waste issue. Uh, so he would source all this food that would otherwise go to waste on farms um, from supermarkets and so forth, and then he'd put on this massive feast. And what it created was enormous amounts of media and then pressure on governments, pressure on companies to actually create that, that change. Um, changes in their policies, purchasing policies, etc. cetera. Uh, so that's kind of what our team is looking at right now. How do we create enough awareness about this plastic issue or other waste issues and then put enough pressure, um, pressure on, on companies and on governments to act? So, sorry, just quickly, um, what I'd like to leave you with is this idea that really nothing, nothing is waste, everything is a material, everything is circular. And I think here in Singapore and in the region, we need to change in this because of the rising populations, but we also have an economic opportunity to do so. Um, so I, I'm, I, feel my heart is in Singapore, and I feel very frustrated that in Singapore we're still doing things in a very linear type of system. Uh, we're actually building this huge waste management facility in Tuas, 
$3 billion worth or something, which is going to come online by 2027, but is still entirely linear, even though the entire world is moving towards circularity. And again, you Google any news media organization, Straits Times Today, and they're talking about how amazing this facility is. So it kind of is putting things back in either NGOs' hands or social business' hands to write articles, to raise something, and, and say, really, why, why are we doing this? Um, which is a bit of a challenge. So one thing that my team and I are doing is, is my husband and I run a community farm on weekends, and we're uh, strong believers that Singaporeans are ready to segregate their materials. They're ready to put their food scraps in one container, their recyclables in another, and we would literally not need to send very much to the incinerator then. Um, the government doesn't seem to feel this way, so a little bit inspired by Tristram Stewart, what we're doing is bringing in a mass composter, and we're going to get our entire condo to start segregating, become zero waste, and put all of our stuff, all of our food scraps into compost, and create it as a case study to try and influence uh, the government. We're also going to be holding um, Singapore's first Feeding the 5,000 in uh, November, December this year. Uh, and separate to that, I'm... You know, our team is always going to be looking at how do, we, how do we take this issue and really bring it to the masses and create enough pressure that people have to change. Um, because clearly everything that we've been doing up until this point with how long it takes to get action on climate change, on, on waste management, on plastics, it's not really working. Um, so I look forward to, to hearing your thoughts and having a, a lively debate. Thank you. We were talking a little bit yesterday about um, the waste cycle, as you name it. Um, the two of us were looking at each other and thinking, when we walk through our countries where we live, I live in, in Uruguay and in, in Latin America, and you're here in Asia. I didn't know about the fact that actually 80% of the plastics um, come from Asia, because when I walk through any any place in Latin America, it seems to me that most of the plastic comes from there, so um, it must be even, even worse here. Um, something that happened to us, being from countries like Germany, where we have actually, uh, there's a law on, on the cycle of production, like you, you have to establish this cycle, and um, we were world champions in, in recycling, that's true. But it's also, in my country, a question of resources, like we don't have oil and, and that needs to be bought and plastic has to be produced and um, so it's preferable to do that with plastic that already exists and um, w we were thinking a, li a little bit joking about the fact that when we walk and see the plastic bottles all over the place, we talk to uh, fellow companions from that place, from those places saying, oh, but you're throwing away money. It's, it's really, you know, a resource that you have then you could use it cheaply. And um, it's a question, yes, you're right, of, of money at the end when it comes down to money because whenever we have political discussions about, um, not only about recycling, but also about... Um, paying an extra cost to hand uh, for when you buy a plastic bottle and you bring it back to the store. I don't know the name in English, how you call it. Proce the deposit system. Um, whatever politicians would tell you is, yeah, but if, if you don't find anyone for whom it pays off, it's, it's really difficult to put it on politically, on the agenda. And um, as we see in some countries, well, there are ways to actually make it pay. But what does the engineer and activist tell us about that? And um, how do we uh, get the elephant eaten a little bit quicker, are we? So, thank you. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank uh, the Conrad Adenauer Stifting for inviting me here. It's an unusual setting to be talking about this, but I must say I learned a lot in the last day and a half uh, listening to the fantastic conversations. Uh, I literally very literally speak in two languages. One is the language of uh, environmental policy and uh, legislation and as an environmental activist. And today I've been asked to, to speak on the art of uh, political um, uh, messaging uh, as an artist, which is the other language I speak on. So most of my presentation will be about 
the other, uh, other part of my life. And um, I just want to start off by saying, questioning the idea of, uh, of, the, idea of the political. And uh, I want to sort of talk about what is the political in nature? What is the idea of nature? How do we look at it today? Why does it, why does it completely uh, uh, almost um, persevere, increasingly so in all aspects uh, of, our, of our lives? And uh, it's literally the, the, the silence of the elephant in the room. It's something we don't know how to talk about. And uh, this has very clearly been marked out by Amitav Ghosh, who uh, first in the Chicago uh, family lectures in Berlin, uh, which was translated into, into a book called The Great Derangement, very clearly as a well-known nonfiction writer, talks about the impossibility of talking about climate change because it's like talking about death. And he questions why is it that we find it impossible to talk about events which are so looming large, like hyperobjects, as Timothy Morton, the eco-critic, says, that we have no long language to speak about it. And this is what I want to address, how art can uh, transcend some of the barriers of our known languages and what is the language of art through which we address some of these issues uh, which confront us uh, today. Uh, I do believe nature forms the underpinning of our economic, social, and political system. That's my idea of sustainability, and this has many resonances right now, and we have not found a good way to speak about it. When, I'm speaking of, when we're speaking of green society, we, we are really thinking of reinventing our very systems on which our social edifice, our economic systems, have been based. Uh, till, uh, till now, from, at least from the last 500 years, we know that uh, nature was assumed to be free. It's never figured out, never been part of a mainstream conversation. We've assumed economic systems are separate from nature. Actually, all economy is based on natural resources. Uh, and there's been very clearly marked out historically in many of the writings that nature is meant to be controlled in the service of man. And what we have done to it today is now we are having markers of the threatening of our existence. This painting on the right you see is a uh, 18th century painting by a well-known European painter uh, who is a painting you can see, it's about the controlling of, of rivers. Uh, from then, from the margins, in the last 15 years, uh, in a very rapid pace, well, actually from, from, still from the 70s onwards, but increasingly in the last 15 years, we've seen nature come from the margins to the center. The number of reports, starting from the Ro Club of Rome Limits of Growth Report, to the IPCC fifth, fifth assessment report, which marks out climate change, to books like the Sixth Extinction, which say this is the time when we're going to lose major biodiversity, and the current naming of this era as the Anthropocene, as suggested by Paul, Paul Crutzen, who was a Nobel, he's a Nobel scientist. Uh, so it's the nature has moved from the margins back to the center of our conversations. What Laura talked about, circle economy, is one marker of reforming systems, the very intrinsic idea of economic systems. And it is not enough, we, we have recognized, to make small technical solutions alone. We are looking at reforms of the very economic system we are based on. And secondly, as a parallel thing, there are increasing questions about rethinking the man-nature relationship. Ma major Writers like Timothy Morton or Donna Haraway are writing about it as part of feminist theory or as part of uh, uh, ecological uh, theory. And this just marks out some of the, you can see the documents on the right which, which are documenting this. Uh, the question is, can the language of art have a transformative potential? Because what do artists do? Why should we listen to artists to do, do their own thing? And I, I as an activist, but also as an, as an artist, practicing artist, I strongly believe that art can do what nothing else can do. And I'm going to talk about some of the works of my friends, other artists, uh, also a, a bit of my, of my own work, and take it from the representation of an idea of what is happening to the insightful. When art can play a discursive role, it can change the discussion itself of what is happening in the room. Like the elephant in the room, you, you can start seeing the elephant and it changes the way you, you interact with it. Uh, and I'm mostly concerned about issues of marginality. Uh, I'm, uh, from the stories, from the ground up, of, uh, uh, of the small and marginal farmer, of the artisanal 
uh, fishermen, the tribal societies, the loss of the ecosystems, the, in the increasing invasion of waste and toxicity uh, in, in our bodies. We have increasingly studies to show how there's toxicity which we don't even know how to measure in all parts of our living and, and non-living. Uh, uh, and, and, the, and, the, and the invasion of capital uh, through corporate power into all kinds of ecosystems. And I'm going to s start saying that the idea of art is not a new thing. I just mark out a very important social movement in India called the Chipko movement, which was based on resistance songs. This is just a picture from it and a song I don't want to translate right now, but it's one of the songs which got the communities together. Now this picture, uh, the next picture you see is of a film made on the Narmada movement by a well-known um, filmmaker, my, one of my contemporaries, uh, Sanjay Kak, called Words and Water. He spent many years on the movement, making this film about the movement itself, marking out the, the inner workings, not the rhetoric, not in what you might say as a headline, but the inner workings of a movement like that. Uh, so art as, as has many, many kinds of roles. And since we have only have 10 minutes left, I will quickly take you some of these artists. This is a picture from Hamburg, from a very well-known uh, project called Park Fiction, by, done by three artists, Christopher Schaefer, Margaret Stenzi, and Ellen Schmeiser, uh, who, as artists, reclaimed a piece of land, which if you go to Hamburg on the Elbe Bank, you can see that piece of land. He created a community park, which is still a uh, very alive community park. And their role was as uh, artists working with communities. Uh, this picture is from another artist called Sri Jata Roy, who's been working with a low-income community in New Delhi, uh, working on, again on a park, from a park which is completely criminalized to making it habitable for uh, women, as you can see, and children. Uh, and it's a place called Dakshinpuri. Those of you ever go to Delhi, you can, if you make an effort, you can see that park functioning. And this, she works as an artist, she's a trained artist who does that. Uh, a, a clip of a film, not a clip, a photo from a film from another very deeply engaged artist called Amar Kanwar. He had a show here in Bombay, uh, in, uh, sorry, Singapore, at the CCA, uh, I think a couple of years back. He's a very well-known filmmaker. He's gone to document her four times. And uh, this is a, he has, all these artists I'm telling you about have had very deep and long engagements with communities. So Amar Kanwar has worked with the communities uh, of displacement of forests in Orissa, and he continues to work. In fact, in the last documenta, documenta 2017, he has a new film there. Uh, this is another work uh, of an artist I deeply respect called Navjot Altaf. Uh, her work uh, is called Lacuna and Testimony. She, Navjot has been working with tribal and buster communities in central India uh, and trying to get collaborative art practices uh, as art as a way of getting traditional knowledge on, on the foreburner. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a slide from a, a project I was involved in which questions the boundary of language of art. This is a, a, it's the live courtroom uh, set up as a performative courtroom with a real judge and real lawyers. And the idea was three artists presenting their artwork on landscape as witness to another ideas of uh, language of, of what evidence might be caused. So questioning the very boundaries of what might, you might uh, uh, conceptually call uh, evidence uh, in, in a courtroom. Now, just uh, quickly through some of my own work, this is a, uh, some, a slide from a, a three-year-long enga three engagement I've had with the fishing community, with the specific fishermen uh, off the coast of Chennai. Uh, and this is an ongoing work where I really look at both culturally through his old Tamil, he's a Tamil fisherman, old Tamil language, uh, but also uh, through his perception of what's happening in the show and his distance from the climate change conversations. I do attend the climate change conversations and you can see the rhetoric of the poor, but not the bringing in of the real problems of the poor. And I'm interested in marginality because I think this is the marginality which will be left out of even in nation state conversations, which are claiming to be working as democratic institutions for everybody. Uh, this is another work which I did over three years. Most of the projects are very long. Uh, this, uh, looking at migrant workers in South Gujarat. Uh, it was done between 2000, uh, 1996 and 2000. It's looking at the reasons of migrancy 
for people, you know, 90% 90, 90 of Indian uh, labor in India, as in many parts of the developed world, are mig internal migrants. They're migrants because of loss of land, loss of agricultural labor, or lack of resources in the rural hinterland. So they are really ecological refugees internally. Of course, the issue of migrants has become international right now, but, my, uh, but internal migration has been the cornerstone of all labor across developing countries. This is another work I did, uh, invited by a forest community, which was uh, marked out of, uh, uh, because of new forest laws. They were excluded from the forest because the new forest laws are based on, on, on exclusion of people. Uh, and this is a long history of uh, the imperial forest laws in, in, in a colonial state. And they have now become part of the Indian state's forest laws, but uh, slightly modified through other laws. But still, the, the, the idea of conservation is excluding people. And uh, Mahesh Rangarajan, the famous historian, has written a lot about a book called Fencing the Forest, about the imperial. So many of these are traces of what's happened over a period of time. Uh, and uh, another story about the extinction of the South Asian vulture, uh, another work which I did over many years. But this, this, this set of pictures is from intervention in a, a natural history museum in New Delhi. Uh, and as you know, the, the South Asian vulture, there were 10 million South Asian vultures of th uh, three species uh, in the region. Less than 0.3% uh, uh, of them survive. And they have been killed in 50, 20 years because of one pill called diclofenac made by a company called Novatis, uh, which is given to the, uh, the livestock so they don't have pain when, they, when you take out milk. But when the vulture feeds on them, it destroys the internal organs. So it's an extinction of a species which has survived. You see the, the, the vulture being mentioned uh, in Cleopatra's throne and in the Garur in the Ramayana. It's one of the oldest and most hardy species. But in 15 years, we have destroyed that vulture because of our uh, non-understanding of how these chemicals impact other species. Uh, finally, I want to just uh, show this image of the other work we do. Uh, as an organization called Toxics Link, which is engaged in environmental policy uh, uh, and legislation from the ground up for uh, over 22 years. Uh, we worked across the area in areas of waste, uh, lead in, we are very targeted, removing lead in paints, uh, looking at electronic waste, uh, looking at chemicals in babies' products, uh, uh, things we don't know about, things we don't seem to care about, has deep implications on our health. Again, uh, under the radar, but something we need to, uh, need to see. And I'm glad that Laura mentioned circular economy, because uh, circular economy, uh, India has now adopted the circular economy framework, one of the first developing countries to have done so, uh, though the conversation started only in 2012 in Germany. So just to leave you with three levels of art responses. Uh, the first is about how art helps you think, decolonize the thinking about nature. A lot of the language we use right now is language which is, we have learned to use. For example, the category of nature itself. Uh, Timothy Morton, amongst others, Bruno Latour, have been questioning whether the way we construct categories outside, of the inside and the outside, the us and them, whether they're real categories of engagement. And I found throughout my engagement with communities that these categories are very questionable. So when you call something as nature, what is it we are talking about? We, we do not interact with something called nature. Only if you're abstracted and separate from nature, you interact with it. If you look at living communities with nature, they interact with very specific elements of nature. They interact with the tree, with the forest, with our produce. But the word nature is not something which is very real for them. The second is about speaking truth to power. And this is what art does in, its, in a very different way, in a very temporally different way. And everything which we, every, every nature of change we see in society is not through only activist work, work or through journalist writing. And I think there are many other modes of communications, of thought forming, of attitude forming, of understanding what's going on that takes, has a different resonance. And I think these are some of the areas where the language of art uh, transcends other languages. And it's a very personalized language, uh, but it's a, 
the, uh, it, it's a very committed language because there's no way you can be a, a recognized artist and be dishonest to yourself. You cannot make up the language of art uh, because it will be, end up as, as bad art. Thank you. Thank you so much. Avi, you talked a lot. This is just uh, food for thought and for later on um, things that I uh, would, would uh, throw into the discussion. Um, you talked about the marginalization, which is quite interesting because um, actually when, when we uh, put on everything we've heard throughout the conference and how we have to get social, how a politician should appeal to somebody, what do we do to actually get in somebody's brain and to, to have them develop emotions, what kind of emotions, uh, whatever that would be. Um, and then, for example, if we look at the people who are affected by intoxication, by um, the climate change, we talked yesterday about uh, media coverage uh, on the floodings here in, in Asia, uh, compared to the media coverage uh, in, on Houston, and then I didn't even dare or I dared to mention uh, what's going on all the time in Latin America when it comes to flooding, like all the time. It's just, it's already not a, not a, a news anymore. Um, and on the other side, nothing would be more engaging than, you know, a nice journalistic piece on a person, a family, affected by any of, of those um, dangerous outcomes. And maybe some uh, anecdote, I lived in Argentina for quite some years and there's a huge problem with pesticides, coming back to Toxic Link, um, because the agricultural industry is really an industry that is almost run without people and uh, based on uh, lots of pesticides and whenever you, you drive by a soya field or you know a soya country you could name it like that because the, the territories are so vast it's, it's really amazing how there are almost no insects anymore and no birds and then there are all these uh, law cases and lawsuits of people who, are, who suffer cancer and their families suffer cancer and it doesn't get into the news, and I was surprised to actually read a long piece um, in a German magazine. But then again, nothing there before and thereafter, and that brings us back to your point also, and how to make it visible via journalists, via great art campaigns. But the thing actually is, how do we get it out there? How do we you know, raise the consciousness? I mean, I'll just make a very short point that for example, if you look at floods in cities, you look at floods, you know, I can talk about India, we don't want to talk about the US or other places. Look at floods in Delhi or the floods in Chennai. There are reasons why these floods happen. It's not just the rain has come and suddenly it's start flooding has happened. If you fill up, if you, if you kill all the catchment areas of where your water is supposed to be, if you take all the riverbanks and build on them, then the water is just finding its own level. The very deep, just an example to show, very deep intrinsic connection between our topography and how we build our cities, which if you talk to an urban planning student or an urban planner, they have no recognition of this. So it's very much here, and unfortunately we only see crisis. And uh, crisis almost is when it's too late. And then we want to have a quick fix because it's too late to change anything else. That's why I think journalism has a role, but other ways in which we influence the way we think about things also has to have an equal role. Vladimir, you're next. And we're keen, well, you're, you've been traveled the world with your works as well. And this is the paper. But tell us a little bit, what do your students, when you say the urban uh, study students don't even know about it, um, it's a little bit, you know, actually it's common sense that the water should be able to go somewhere. But what happens to your students? Um, maybe you can talk a 
about that also, um, amongst other things. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks for inviting me. It's a great uh, honor to be here and uh, also to be the final speaker of this uh, conference. So I'm going to talk about um, what artists can do or what artists uh, do in order to kind of affect or um, uh, address some problems that we see around us. So uh, I'll start by just saying a few things about myself. Uh, I come from Serbia and I studied uh, painting. Um, during the time when we had kind of like a lot of wars and uh, this is one drawing of one kind of typical night of um, when you don't have electricity for 16 hours a day and you go out with your friends to play basketball uh, under the moon uh, light and, uh, and you see a tomahawk passing by and uh, this tomahawk is about two tons and it costs a few million dollars and uh, it's gonna hit uh, something. Uh, so it's, uh, when you see this technology as a student, so you don't go to school, you just kind of go out and have fun uh, without electricity, then this, this technology starts to kind of talk to you and, um, and I, start to think, I started to think about technology even though I was, I was just painting at that time. So um, I'll talk about uh, different examples of uh, works that uh, I find interesting and uh, yeah, hopefully they'll be It'll inspire you to maybe ask some questions. And um, this is one project that visualizes uh, centers of power. Um, so this is an artist who basically just uh, made a visualization of um, companies that are very powerful in the US and uh, CEOs of these companies. And, uh, and it's just basically information. So you can go to this website. You can kind of draw your own connections. You can find how companies are connected. Uh, there are lots of artists making maps, and uh, this is another group from uh, France, uh, Bureau d'Etudes, and uh, they, they, they also do all kinds of maps that can be very subjective, very personal, but they basically provide us with some information about uh, the world around us. So I would say that often artists, when they just provide information for others, they can um, kind of have some political power maybe. Um, one very interesting work that is coming uh, lately from Serbia, from a friend of mine, he's um, doing this uh, visualization of uh, all the software um, processes that go behind social networks. So uh, this is a project called Facebook Algorithmic Factory. Um, in which a um, group of people from Serbia, Poland, uh, they basically visualized uh, all kinds of data about Facebook. Uh, how do they, um, what services are kind of hidden and what, what these services do in order to basically sell this free labor uh, that they're getting from all of us. So um, the map is quite extensive. I really encourage you to, to go to this website and, and take a look at this. Uh, it's, uh, it's the only map like this in the world. It's also a very subjective map, but, um, uh, but it provides you with some information. And uh, this also group compares Facebook, like the invention of new slavery, etc. cetera. So uh, it's, it's quite interesting. Another thing I was gonna talk about is these things that artists do, like they, 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 uh, they do actions in order to kind of affect the environment around themselves. Some artists just visualize, um, and other artists um, yeah, do some action. So this is a very famous uh, project by an artist group from Switzerland called eToy. They had a URL, they had a website, eToy.com, but American company eToys, they kind of stole this website from them. After several months uh, of negotiation and trying to pay them money, artists didn't want to sell this uh, URL. And the company just kept persisting and asking them to, to give them the, the URL. And at the end, the company stole it from them, and then the artist announced the war uh, against this uh, corporation. And what happened over the course of six months, the company lost a few million dollars uh, because artists were doing all kinds of activities <laughs> uh, that, were, that they were not supposed to do. So they, uh, they hired hackers, uh, they did all kinds of campaigns, and uh, they did this uh, very kind of simple software system called like DOS, denial of service, so they would just attack the website, crash the website, and the, the shares fell down, and at the end, this company from the US kind of uh, um, stopped uh, the case, so they lost, and the artists were quite um, um, successful, and uh, the, the same kind of artists are also behind this project. It's called Google Elite itself, and what they do, they write software that will um, um, create hidden websites, 
and create ads on these websites and just automatically click on these ads. And by clicking automatically on Google ads, the software is charging money to Google. So Google is basically paying these artists for uh, the ads that nobody clicks, that their software clicks. So it's also kind of a form of media activism and hacking. Uh, they, here you can see a photo from their bank account, how Google is paying the money, and there is a claim that they made 400,000 US dollars. Uh, I'm not sure if this is valid information, but uh, also another very interesting uh, group is uh, this group called Yes Men. I don't know if you heard about them. They're really super famous uh, for doing uh, fake news. They ran uh, all kinds of websites. Uh, they had a fake WTO website, fake uh, George W. Bush uh, website during George W. Bush campaign. And uh, they get a lot of threatening letters from all kinds of lawyers. And uh, they, uh, they do these actions all the time. And often BBC and uh, other uh, news agencies invite them to, to give talks and give expert opinions about certain subjects. And then what they do, they go in and they totally smash it. They, they make it into a big show and a big performance. Uh, so they dealt with Shell Oil, with Exxon Mobil, um, and they're totally brutal when they, uh, when they present their work. There are a couple of films about them. Currently, they're doing some work on Trump, and there is also this, this project. So you can go to this website. It's a fake website. Uh, it's called Share the Safety, and um, they say uh, you can how it works. You can go to this website, you can buy a gun, uh, then uh, you can pick a place, then they will send you this gun, and they will also send a free gun to somebody who is underprivileged, somebody who cannot afford the gun. So it's all fake, um, but uh, it kind of raises awareness of, of, of some issues about safety. Um, this is maybe one project that uh, I think could be interesting to show the video uh, of. And this, what they did for this project, they published their own version of New York Times. For one day, they uh, did like 20,000 copies and they just distributed uh, 20,000 copies of New York Times that tells the truth. That's what they uh, say. So I hope there are some journalists here. Maybe they will enjoy this project. Maybe if you can play the video, that would be great. So you can just get a bit of an idea. Is uh, volume up, if possible. Early this morning, New York City commuters were amazed to find their favorite paper telling it like it is in a really big way. A special edition of today's New York Post showed what could happen to the Big Apple if the threat of climate change is ignored. Oh yeah, everyone's been talking about it. It's all over the city. The paper highlights an official report predicting massive climate catastrophes for the city, including public health disasters and flooded subways. I can't believe I'm reading this in the Post. My God. I'm killing the world. We are. Nobody's doing nothing about it. I'm not too worried. What? Is this the same post that denied climate change like two years ago? This is an issue which doesn't just concern progressives and liberals. It's an issue which concerns everyone in America. Okay. Does this seem like the usual post to you? No. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> the paper is actually a hoax with a twist. Everything in it is factual. That would grab somebody's attention. That would grab a lot of people's attention. Do you think people have to wait for it to happen, or do you think they can raise awareness before it happens? I would like to see awareness raised. You know, everybody would like to have their awareness raised. We at the Post are uh, absolutely shocked that they're picking our newspaper, of all newspapers, to, to, to scare people using scare tactics of the Obama socialist uh, uh, environmentalist agenda. It's ridiculous. Nobody's going to believe that we would go in for this kind of sensationalism. So you don't call this sensationalism? This is, first of all, this is news. Second of all, it's human interest. Look at that girl's face. She has no idea she's standing next to a murderer. This is, this is propaganda. This is sensationalism. Here. Environmentalism. Thank you very much. Okay, Paper please, we can stop here. To it continues. To Tuesday's you can meeting at the UN. Can we stop, please? Um, Sorry, it's New York Post, not New York Times. Uh, so this is another project in which uh, artists got some funding from the city of Vienna, and uh, they founded a consortium that builds uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, and it gives unmanned aerial vehicles to the civil society so that they can spy on the government instead of government spying on, on, uh, on uh, people. Uh, of course, this is often just theoretical, and. Um, 
and it just demonstrates some ideas, but these actions often just finish in the museums or other cultural institutions. Another very interesting project from artists coming from uh, Jogjakarta. It's a very important group uh, called House of Natural Fiber. So uh, during the time when the Indonesian government increased um, taxes on alcohol, there was a lot of deaths of people just uh, drinking uh, homemade alcohol that is contaminated and and uh, and these artists made a reaction to that. So what they did, they made some wine uh, from jackfruit, and they uh, had all these kind of sensors to just kind of have like a wine performance. So yeast were performing with them, and they were also just raising awareness on, on this issue. Uh, this is me, this is the most interesting project of all here. No, this is uh, one old project I did in 2005. And we also talked a little bit about the basics of our needs when it comes to media. So I, I used one of the computer games and instead of shooting each other in a computer game, I created an environment where you can make music. So it's a very kind of happy idea, a uh, hippie idea. Um, but uh, often, yeah, these ideas again finish in museums. This is another project of mine. Uh, it's a game or a financial simulation in which you can invest in different parts of environment, different biomes, and it just kind of shows you what happens when Antarctica dies, and then you can put more money into Antarctica or into deserts, and yeah, I created brochures. And again, it's uh, something that just raises awareness on on uh, these things. Also, like uh, sometimes movies can actually affect people and make them think differently. This is a one of my projects uh, that I did in collaboration with two other filmmakers, and it's about borders. So I filmed uh, construction workers in Singapore. Uh, in Singapore, we have about 1.3 million workers coming from, uh, they're called semi-skilled or unskilled workers, coming from the region. That's about 35% of the working force of Singapore. And, uh, and um, I spent a lot of time filming them, and uh, it, was, it was a project that was shown in film festivals, and then when people see it, they kind of get inspired to maybe think about something. But, but if you have a film that maybe show, is shown to a lot of audiences, how many of you have maybe seen this or heard about it? Yeah, it's, it's a, this is a very interesting project from very uh, also provocative and problematic. Um, it's a project in which Josh Oppenheimer um, uh, hired some of the police officers who were performing massive killings in Indonesia. And uh, he kind of asked them to reenact how did they kill people. And, um, and then he filmed that. And, uh, and this film was screened in a lot of places, and it actually also like affected some of the things that are happening in Indonesia now, and also it affects a lot of young people who are uh, filmmakers and, and so on. But one just last thing I want to talk a little bit about is that often like when artists are making all these actions that can sound and look very kind of funny or wild, uh, sometimes they, they, their message gets misinterpreted. Often people accept to get a message from the artwork, uh, but art is not a um, postal service. You don't have to have a message. So this project is a project by a famous artist, Sam Duran, who, inspired by the hangings of Native uh, Americans uh, that happened 150 years ago, he created a scaffold. Uh, and he exhibited this in Documenta, in Castle. Um, in 2010, I believe. But recently, they, um, this is the instrument or machine for like hanging people, right? So, uh, so he, they just installed this piece in Minneapolis in a very kind of famous park where a lot of famous art is uh, installed. And when that happened, a lot of Native Americans started protesting uh, because they were scared of this machinery. So even though uh, the artist kind of wanted to maybe just raise awareness of, of uh, what white people did uh, long ago, and uh, he wanted to maybe protect the victims, somehow his message was misinterpreted. And I kind of like to uh, end with this uh, slide. It, uh, it makes uh, art look really cool and maybe important. So if you, so Native Americans got really upset and, and uh, yeah, said that uh, you can, if you have a scalp, you can get a reward of 200 bucks. That's it, thank you. Well, if we paid attention, we also learned that things that make you angry raise, it, raise uh, attention and awareness. So maybe. Well, but I 
think we can kind of stick to the huge, huge elephant that's in the room and that has to be eaten <laughs> bit by bit because it's just um, such a vast and broad topic that we have to tackle. And I really want to start um, asking you and the audience to share your experience, to give us questions, um, thoughts, and um, get really into our discussion here. Yes, ma'am. There's the microphone coming up. Yeah. Currently, we face a clickism phenomena, which is the people active in digital media, but passive in the real action and the real life. Do you face similar situation, which is they support you in the social media, but no action in the real life, in the context of campaigning green society? And how do you tackle the problems? Thank you. That goes to all three of you. Um, I don't, as a team, we don't rely on action um, from people within our community to create change um, because uh, we're predominantly a B2B type of organisation, so we work with businesses and with government. Um, so at the moment we rely on ourselves, but we are looking at how do we create that movement to be, you know, whole of Singapore, how do we get everyone on board with this and how do we get them to act. Uh, come back to me in another six months, I think, to, to answer that. I, I, I really don't have the answers. Uh, we've seen it, as you've shared, the US election was the best uh, example where all of the millennials were speaking, but their actual actions uh, are not the same. And you see the same with sustainability research, where millennials say, we, we want to buy X, um, we would buy X because it's more sustainable, but they're not actually acting and, and, and doing it. Um, I think uh, certain, how do you celebrate people acting? Um, like if people are actually, for example, uh, recycling or doing the right thing, how do you then incentivize that and how do you showcase that? Um, or how do you gamify it, I think is, is potential solutions. Um, interested to hear if you've got additional thoughts. So, uh, when I was growing up, of course, there was no social media. Now there is social media. Uh, and you see a lot of activity on it, but it has to be connected to something. So it doesn't happen in isolation. Uh, for example, uh, there's a, there was a big campaign to, well, we were involved in a big campaign to save the Delhi Ridge Forest, which is 8,000 hectares of forest in the middle of the city. And currently, we engage with young people to uh, help create walks and like being a monitoring group and also raise the issue and own the issue of the forest of the city. So they work a lot on social media, but ultimately it is to activate something on the ground. Uh, what I've seen more in social media is the change.org kind of petitions which go around and you can sign it. Uh, it, have, it works in some ways, in some issues, but on really difficult issues like conserving a piece of land or uh, saving a river from something. Uh, uh, it, I have not seen it work on its own. So it's like an aid to somebody connecting something real on the ground. I think, I think you, you made a nice comment. I mean, that's basically people are not really uh, so active uh, outside of the social media. So, like, I mean, the perfect example is, like, if you go to an event and, like, that is advertised on Facebook and a lot of your friends say, like, they're also going to the event and then you go to the event and they're not there. <laughs> so. Yes, and absolutely. When you see, you know, you, you shot the turtle with the plastic um, in its mouth or there's this what I said before, the, the, the teenager on this great project or another initiative. It's so easy to just give a like or share and, and then go on. And that's something I think that um, could uh, be called a missing link, not only in environmental issues or society issues in general, but um, for at least with change.org, you, you can put your name down and demand something. 
but um, it's always easier when somebody else does it. And I think that, you know, now you have a lot of um, experience in that, no? To start and, and really get to action instead of looking and waiting uh, for somebody else to step in and do the groundwork. Okay, let's go to further questions and comments and, and thoughts also. Um, so we've uh, heard a lot about um, the tools, uh, the new tools um, that tech provides for us and uh, social media. I would like to know, can you leverage on that? I mean, is it easier now that you can kind of, out of a small group or even as a single person with a good campaign, um, maybe reach a totally different public or a totally different region, or is it just more noise? I think that, yes, social media has an amazing amount of power. Uh, where I think it has the most power is if you can mobilize a group of people to be behind the same thing, which then forces government to act. Because if you're only getting people interested, um, at the end of the day, there's going to be other busy things that take over what they're interested in. So even if everyone's, you know, excited about the Dutch guy that's trying to take plastics out of the ocean or they get excited about, you know, XX next, um, an hour later, 30 seconds later, they're distracted by something else which is the top of their mind. So I see the power in social media as to how do you bring together a group of people that are interested and which can campaign together or, or be a group of people together to influence government policy. Um, because more and more you look at uh, where, the, again, I'm reminded of a word from, from a National Geographic explorer, how do we wake up this sleeping giant that is the public? Um, the public is, is completely asleep when it comes to environment, um, social issues, that I think the best way to the influence that change is how do we influence government policy um, and get people behind us and supporting to influence that government policy. I'll give you an example. When we were campaigning to take out lead from paints, which uh, surprisingly in most developing countries you still have lead in paint, which is very, very toxic. It's one of the highest exposures to children, that's by WHO. Uh, by putting it out on social media, we had parents call up the company saying, can we get unleaded paint? And so it created a pressure on the companies to believe that, that the parents who want a different choice of paints than what was readily available. So in, uh, I think if you target your message as well, because I do think that a lot of the problems is are because of the way uh, we've become very happy consumers now. You know, it's very nice, it's a nice life and we can consume whatever we want. But every consumption has uh, some kind of a trail and that trail needs to be, uh, in, people need to be informed about what the trail is. So there has to be good research behind telling you what good information, what is really happening out there. You know, is the product you're using, what's happening to it, where does it come from, what does it contain? And a lot of the policy issues today are trying to deal with issues of labeling and chemicals in products. These are sort of uh, international conversations right now because it's so difficult to get information on what we're using. So even the clothes we are wearing, you know, what, where were they made, what chemicals did they use, uh, the towels we use, do they have any residual chemicals in them? Now, this is information which, is, if we know, we will act upon. So one of the big problems right now is that we don't have enough information or the information we have uh, is not strong enough for people to want to act, in a sense. So I do believe information is key to people becoming aware. And But there are many barriers to information. Uh, companies don't want to give information very easily. They put up all kinds of issues of, you know, uh, um, uh, what they call uh, com uh, uh, product uh, secrecy and all that. Uh, so there are, so if that information, uh, it's, it, we have to really truly use the information age we are in today. And I think then people will make a real choice. So if you know that your, what your, the chair you're sitting on is from an original, Amazon teak forest, you'll think twice about 
So I don't think people don't care. I think people really do care. But they just don't know what to do. And they don't know why it's important to do that. Sometimes they know, sometimes they don't know. Can I actually just add quickly, has anyone here seen John Oliver? Show of hands. Is any, yeah? Um, fans of John Oliver? Yeah? So I, I actually reckon John Oliver is one of the best examples of being able to use social media to influence change in society or uh, policy. Um, there was one he did on net neutrality, which I think made him fa famous for his work. So for anyone who doesn't know, John Oliver um, is from... Um, Daily Show, yeah, um, from Daily Show, and he now does, um, what is it, Last Week Tonight, and uses in kind of investigative journalism and this amazing sense of humour to create, say, 10 or 15 minute in-depth sort of video journalism stories about big issues, like independence with internet, how we, we sh as consumers should be able to get independent internet uh, or, or something like that. How do you make that interesting for 15 minutes, right? For, for You're not going to read a paper, you're certainly not going to listen to me talk about it. So, But he's done this incredible job at mixing in humour to get people really interested in these topics. He's done things on, on food waste, on politics, and over the course of the last couple of years has generated this huge following, um, constantly criticises po uh, politicians, companies and so forth and uses uh, hashtags throughout it. So for his net neutrality one, he had a hashtag um, and he basically managed to get everyone involved and crash the, uh, I think, the government server um, and generate that change. So I think there's, you, you need that mix of in, uh, uh, good factual base and investigative journalism along with humour uh, in order to actually generate that change. But you, you also need that time to generate the following. Um, because you could create amazing content and stories, but if you have no following, you're not going to do anything. Um, so I think it, it really needs momentum. Yeah, I think it's also a great question, and uh, probably it kind of all comes to the first question as a lady about like how like we have a lot of noise online, and you have we have people who are very powerful, like on YouTube, uh, you have identities, charismatic characters that you go and follow and I don't know I watch a lot of YouTube trash because I'm trying to do a project <laughs> with YouTube and uh, it's uh, it's a lot of noise your question was about this noise right that, that uh, so I would say um, the content doesn't matter anymore you know you can um, watch people like eat food you know they can uh, talk about products uh, they can uh, show uh, refugees dying you know it's all kind of very similar we have like different emotional responses to all this, uh, but there is a lot of noise. And um, so I don't know, I mean, um, these people are very influential. Like on YouTube, you have people who have 50 million subscribers and uh, they're talking to large audiences, yeah. So 50 million, it's quite a bit. And uh, these people, they get products from all over the world uh, for free. And uh, they take these products, they use them, and they market them. So uh, I'm just curious to see, like maybe politicians would also like have a connection with these like powerful people from from social media and try to find the ways to get more votes through them, or I don't know. <laughs> and then how would these people react? Is there going to be more noise, or uh, or they're going to be changing the way things are? I don't know. Yeah, it's it's super complicated. Well, there's a case study from Germany on that, just really quick. Um, Angela Merkel, she invited the top four YouTubers for the young generation um, to interview her. <laughs> and um, everybody would think the same thing, that would be, uh, yeah, but everybody would think, oh, that would be interesting, and let's uh, get the young people engaged with that. And what happened is that all four of them actually was so sweet with her and wouldn't dare to ask her anything, anything of substance. Um, there was, I think the most interesting question was, what would you print on, a, on your t-shirt or something? But there was nothing really of, of substantial or um, existential um, meaning um, asking the most powerful woman of the world. That, happened in Germany, maybe uh, John Oliver would be much more in-depth and, and much more um, dangling. But yeah, that's kind of a good experiment. And yeah, 
Okay, more uh, thoughts or uh, yes, ma'am. Hello. Um, I think because the topic is so broad and there's there's not just one elephant in the room. I think there are a lot of elephants in the room. So I kind of want to ask um, specifically about pressure and campaigns and how do how do you put pressure on governments or on corporations? Why is it that even if you have the correct information and the, the research done and all this journalism, investigative journalism done, that we still have politicians who can stand up and say, I don't believe in climate change, climate change is a lie. Why is it that we have, it? why, uh, as in, okay, just tell us a little bit more about campaigning um, and pushing this, uh, pushing pressure onto the people who can actually effect change uh, to bring that change about. Because I think as individuals, if there's just a lot of talk and no action, just keeps going nowhere, which we have been doing for the last 20 years, yeah. Um, or maybe just to add on that, um, the politicians who, who deny climate change, they're kind of a minority, but how do you put pressure on politicians, governments that actually signed the Paris Agreement and Kyoto and still don't really seem to act fiercely on it? Okay, uh, that drawing that I shown, I studied painting, so that was from my third year of my studies. And from the in second year, we had a protest for 100 days. So we protested against the government of Serbia uh, because of various reasons. And uh, we didn't have school, so that was my second year. And then we did all kinds of art actions, and we had performances, we were like drawing, giving this to people, just trying to make the change. And we had like our own Serbian spring at that time because the change happened. The, the new government came, uh, the, the whole Serbia celebrated, and that took a long time. Uh, so um, it took a long time, and a lot of people yeah, lived very kind of <laughs> poor lives. And uh, so there were all kinds of strategies. And I was also showing like a lot of examples. But then when the new change happens, then there are new problems, you know, and, um, and then you have to kind of create new campaigns. And uh, I don't know, yeah. So. So how do you how do you make a good campaign? Uh, there are all kinds of ways, yeah, depending on uh, what you need to campaign for. I mean, uh, I showed an interesting example of artists um, just trying to be stronger than the company and hiring hackers. Uh, I can, yeah, tell you more stories from Serbia, but they're so brutal that I don't want to share. <laughs> uh, when my yeah, so so, um, but yeah, how do you, you have to be a stronger? You have to be like it's a survival of the fittest in that uh, world. Yeah, there is no fairness there. Yeah, I think. I'd like to hear your thoughts on on what you think is possible as well, uh, and and ideas from the audience as well. Uh, so, I think. We have to use events and we have to use experiences as a way to draw people in. Uh, I'm gonna come back to, to this National Geographic Explorer again because he's the best example I've seen of actually being able to influence government uh, policy or corporate policy. I think uh, one, having really, really good data and research. If you don't have that backbone, you, you really can't argue for anything um, and, and publishing it. Publishing gets that credibility, otherwise you're, a, you're basically a nobody or a nobody as an organization. Um, second, to be able to bring that to the masses in a palatable way. No one wants to hear $1 trillion of the world, uh, world's food is wasted, one third of the world's food is wasted. That's, that's just a number. We can't touch it, we can't feel it, we can't care about it. So how can you then engage people emotionally into that? Can you show them what that looks like as an amount of food? Can you, um, can you get people to start growing things so that they can appreciate it at a, at a school level? Can you hold mass events? Can you put, this is the best example I heard, put a group of five-year-old kids in front of a camera and with a whole lot of wonky fruit and get them to say to the minister, minister, we like this fruit. We don't want our supermarkets to throw this away. How can, how can government say no to that? Like, kids have this amazing power to be able to, to influence change. So, um, 
I think how do you engage really, really young people into into a movement, into a campaign, because that gets noticed by uh, politicians. How do you uh, direct it directly at the right politicians? Uh, and then how do you make enough noise that media becomes your spokesperson uh, for change? Um, so that those would be um, my thoughts based on seeing how well um, this National Geographic Explorer, Tristan Stewart, has done on the food waste issue, where 20 years ago it was a non-issue, um, and nowadays he's managed to change policy in the UK, where if a supermarket cancels an order, um, which affects food waste throughout the entire supply chain, they're fine 1% of their revenue. That's huge money. No supermarket's going to do that ever again. Um, and has changed a lot of other policy um, at a national level, has now got a uh, sustainable development goal um, to halve food waste by 2030 um, and is, is still going. Um, so, yes, data, accuracy, and then finding ways to creatively bring that to the masses um, and communicate it to politicians. From my experience, there's no one way in which change happens. It can happen many, many ways. Uh, depends what you're trying to change. If you're a single point change, it has, it is, you can do with a certain kind of campaign. But if it's a more difficult change, which impacts many more stakeholders, many more areas of work, then it's gonna take a different kind of uh, coming together uh, and a different length of time. But uh, over the last 20, 25 years, we've been working on environmental campaigning. I've seen a lot of things change. Uh, and uh, so if things have gone like that for the last 200, 300 years, and you see 25 years, a lot of change, it shows a changing consciousness. And as people's consciousness have changed, both by not only what environmentalists say, but by other people are saying, or what you see happening around the world yourself, and saying that makes sense. And so there's a, you know, the, the time becomes ripe for a certain kind of change to also happen. So it's not that change happens out of the conditions in which it is right for it to happen. And the conditions cannot be caused just by you or by one or two people. It's caused by many things happening around us. That's why every, everybody, so journalists writing about it or politicians speaking about it or, uh, you know, uh, people like Amitabh Ghosh who are, occupy a totally different kind of space as writers. Uh, you know, literature writers, or poets talking about it, they influence us in many, many different ways. So I think the climate change issue is, uh, we've seen so much change happen already in the climate change issue. And we'll see, despite Mr. Trump not taking it on, but many cities in the US are already taking it on. So there's a certain politics to him not change, taking it on, but we see that change is happening and you cannot be a company which does not want to deal with climate change anymore. Because, for example, you're a car company, all your standards of emission will be dealing with something which, which somehow talks to climate change issue. So, so the systemic, because it's such a deep structural issue that things. So I, I'm, I think that we should, uh, uh, we should not mark, we are trying, the tr getting the idea of nature as something, which means that's what we're talking about, back into our conscious thinking, it's going to take a while, but every step you see that it is slowly getting there. I, yeah, just one thing, because Christine also asked me about the students here, and then I can see, like, in the last 10 years, uh, Singaporean students are more and more interested in environment and nature. So this kind of notion of nature, I think it's, it's changing, and there are lots of art projects in which students want to deal with environmental changes. But the question is, like, if any of these art projects will make any change, you know, and uh, they, um, and what happens, a lot of my students also get hired in the government sector, um, and they, they probably have a certain notion about nature, and they want to have the change, but they, can they affect these changes? Uh, uh, that's again the question, and then we always get back to the maybe first slide that I showed, in which uh, this artist mapped the, um, uh, centers of power in the US and all these big companies with uh, very important CEOs and uh, and maybe this is where the power is maybe they need to change uh, so if you look at the amount of oil spills and, and that are happening every day it's um, 
And this doesn't stop these companies to just continue. So uh, th I think there is a change in the civil society about nature and environmental changes, but there is no change uh, uh, up there in the centers of power, yeah. Well, thank you for that optimistic view. Um, I also don't know if art um, or a piece of art would change something, but whenever it starts um, or it helps people to start thinking and, and um, to be conscious about a certain issues or one of the one million elephants that we do have in, in the room, um, that is a good start. Um, also, I can tell you from, from the side of the Adenauer Foundation, because um, I also have the nice task to, to give you the goodbye later on, that we do have regional programs um, on climate, energy security, and the protection of the environment in every continent. And um, basically, we work with journalists. Um, there are great journalist um, programs out there. Um, we work with politicians, um, and especially the younger ones, and um, try to really implement it, uh, the topic into everything we do. Um, from the country programs to the media programs. Um, well, of course, the energy and, and um, environment programs, but also the merely po political programs, um, like the one that I um, do have in, in Uruguay and Montevideo. I would, um, if uh, the audience is okay with that, I would close down this session um, Thank you very, very much for your attention, um, for being here in this uh, first ACPC, um, which is, has been organized, or is organized still, by the CAS Media Program in Asia. And um, there's um, a favor I want to uh, ask you to really follow up um, in the social networks um, of CAS Media here in Asia to you know, make an online check-in at the Facebook site or to look up on Twitter, to retweet, to leave a commentary and also to be really um, um, serious about a um, survey that will get to you by mail and, and to tell us and tell the colleagues um, what you liked, um, maybe what you didn't like so much. Also to give hindsight or to, to really um, let us know what you would be interested in uh, uh, for a next edition of the conference. Um, what you would like to hear, whom you would like to listen to, just anything that would come to your mind um, to help the Adenauer Foundation to go on, develop and um, yeah, bring your ideas in as well. So really, really thank you very, very much for being here in the name of Torben Stefan, who is the director of the Aisha Media Program, um, in the name of uh, his whole team. I think they've done quite a great job um, in organizing this conference. I myself am surprised and not surprised. I know that they do great work, but um, it's just really great to have been able to attend so many different panels, to listen to so many different uh, experts, to yeah, to have uh, met with you guys. It was really, really interesting to uh, talk to you beforehand and now, and um, obviously we'll give you a follow-up. Um, but to really um, go home and, and have something on your mind that isn't the case with all conferences, to be honest. Um, but this one really is high up there and set high standards for me. And a part of my team is at a similar conference in Bogota these days, but they were crashed by the Pope visit. So <laughs> I don't, I don't know if they, yeah, it's, yeah, that's right. But um, thank you for all for being here, uh, for having participated. Um, stay focused. Um, just follow what the CAS Media Program does because they're really active in the whole region. And yes, give an applause to you and to the audience. Thank you. <laughs>